data from start to finish, going from protocol all the way through to publication. The protocol is going to outline the exams, procedures, outcomes, endpoints, visit schedules, and your analysis plan, albeit brief. A full statistical analysis plan, or SAP, will be written prior to analysis occurring and oftentimes prior to the start of the study, depending upon the funding agency or if you have an FDA oversight. So let's take a look at an example using the primary objective from the COMBI-RX clinical trial. In the protocol, in the COMBI-RX randomized controlled trial in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, you will see the primary objective. It reads, the primary objective of this study is to determine whether combined treatment with interferon beta 1A, abbreviated as INFB, IM or intramuscularly, once weekly, and glutiramor acetate, abbreviated GA, subcutaneously, daily, is more effective than either agent alone in treating relapsing remitting MS as determined by a reduction in relapse rate. There are a number of things in this research question that you can pull out, one of which is that this is a partial factorial study. So we have two single agents, the interferon and the glutiramor acetate, so the INF and the GA, that will be offered in combination, so active interferon and active glutiramor acetate, versus each single agent alone. So interferon plus matching placebo for the GA and glutiramor acetate plus matching placebo for interferon. So all participants in this three-arm study will be taking two different injections, a weekly injection and a daily injection. 50% of the participants, this is a two-to-one-to-one -to -one randomization, so 50% will get the active-active combination. 25% will get active interferon placebo GA, and another 25% of randomized participants will get active GA plus placebo interferon. We can also see that we can pull out some data elements from this research question. Again, we know treatment arm, so a partial factorial. It's partial because there's no placebo-placebo arm. It is no longer ethically acceptable to treat relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis without treatment. There are a number of first-line therapies that are available. So this is a partial factorial. We're looking for the combination to be more effective in that we want fewer relapses in the combination arm compared to either of the single-agent arms. What you will notice is that the research question is not directly comparing the single agent arms. Both of these single agents are known to be effective for multiple sclerosis. The study was not designed to compare the individual treatment arms. It was designed to compare the combination to each of the treatment, single treatment arms. We have a definition of our population, a general one, that's relapsing or admitting multiple sclerosis. So that's our type of MS. And then we're looking at our outcome of relapse rate and relapses in a defined amount of time. So to have a rate, it has to be the number of relapses out of a specific amount of time. So let's look at the data elements that we can pull from this sentence. The treatment will be assigned at randomization. That's done on the randomization form. Relapsing remitting is the type of MS, and there are diagnosis criteria for this. That will be collected on our screening form. To assess whether or not something is more effective, that will be fewer relapses or a lower relapse rate. That happens in analysis. And then the relapse rate involves symptoms and a clinical confirmation compared to a prior examination where there were no symptoms. And that's actually going to take place across multiple forms and visits. So how do we get from the data elements to the case report forms? Before we do that, let's take a look at some pieces of the protocol. So if we look here at the COMBI-RX protocol, you can see here 2.1 is the primary objective, but 2.1.2 gives the definition of a relapse. And it turns out there were three relapse definitions in this protocol. The protocol defined relapse or a primary endpoint is a relapse seen within seven days of onset. So of course here we'll need the date of the start of the symptoms. 
verified by the treating clinician and independently observed as a change in the EDSS, it's the expanded disability scale. This relapse is defined as the appearance of new symptoms or worsening of an old symptom attributable to MS, accompanied by a change in the neurological examination. That's the EDSS, and there's some definitions of change. And then it has to last at least 24 hours in the absence of fever. It is known that if a person has a concomitant illness, a fever, the flu, a cold, that their symptoms may worsen. That does not constitute a relapse. We are looking at a concomitant indication-free relapse here and preceded by stability or improvement for at least 30 days. So that means we have to compare it to a prior examination that's at least that long ago. We can look at the inclusion and exclusion. That gets us our relapsing remitting population. How do we get there to our data elements? Well, if we go and look at the CombiRx case report form set, we can start very simply with our screening and disease history. And this is performed on every participant that is screened for the study. So they're initially consented, and then this form will be filled out on every single person that is considered for the study, whether they meet the eligibility criteria or not. The reason for that is simple. We need to have an understanding of who is being excluded for the study and for what reasons. And so if at some point we need to change any of the criteria, this is how we would know which ones would need to be changed if possible. So you can see on the screening form here that we have basic demographics. Here are specific questions for medical exclusions, drug exclusions, and non-medical exclusions. So this is our main inclusion exclusion criteria here that are associated with the exclusionary part. Then we move on to another page that looks at the year of symptoms, diagnosis, what are the exacerbations, date of most recent pre-study exacerbation. So this is a screening criteria that has to have confirmation from a clinical record. And then we're asking about prior drug therapies. Remember that there were some specific inclusion and exclusion criteria associated with medications and in the prior two years. Here are the standard questions uh, about our relapses. These are known and defined criteria for relapsing remitting diagnosis. So you can see they follow a number of skip patterns. So it's not simply does this participant have relapsing remitting MS. We actually need to know how it was defined. This two or more clinical attacks with two or more objective clinical lesions is the primary criteria. If that answer is yes, then they are done. They've met definition of relapsing remitting MS. If it's no, then we move into some additional definitions uh, called the McDonald criteria. So this has to be completed on every participant before they can be considered into the study. Here is the form for relapse assessment. So you can see here is the subject having new neurological symptoms or acute worsening of pre-existing symptoms related to MS. That was our primary uh, concern or definition for relapse. And there's a number of situations throughout this form where if they answer no or yes, then they stop the form. It's not considered a relapse. So if no, then they're, they're done. If yes, what was the date of onset? If it's today, then skip to question two. If it was lasting more than 24 hours. So now we're getting into the rules that are associated with the definition of relapse. Then we ask them what symptoms the neurological findings were associated with. Then we ask them some more date-specific questions. Then again, here is the definition of relapse. We actually asked the physician who was examining the participant, the treating clinician, to guess as to whether or not they thought it was a relapse. They, however, were not determining whether or not it was a relapse. This has to be combined with the next form and adjudicated by the statistical center as compared to the prior disability level. So you can see here we have a relapse record number that is generated down here on the bottom of the form. This allowed for us to track things by a relapse number rather than trying to track them by date and participant. That way when we're merging forms, particularly for follow-up, then we are able to easily match those. So consider that if you have cross-form information, create a way to merge them, and if you have to go across visits, create a good way to merge them. This form assesses the neurological situation for the participant when they present for relapse and also at every quarterly visit, because if they come in for a relapse, then they have to have had a change in status, and it will be compared to their prior EDSS form to see if they have in fact changed.
So you can see here as we go through the EDSS, there's a several things that need to be assessed on each participant. We get all the way down here and we have a systems check. So you can see here they have to enter in the score from each prior score. We double check that those match. If they don't match when they enter it, they have to go back and correct one of them. Then they have an ambulation worksheet. Then they give the final EDSS scoring. So it is several composite scores plus ambulation combined together to give us a score here from 0 to 10. All of those things combined together help the statistical center then determine if there in fact was a relapse. So we needed three forms, a screening form, a relapse form, and a disability form to determine if there in fact had been a relapse in a relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis participant. So once we have the case report forms and we begin collecting data, we'll have interim reporting. There are several types of interim reports. Most commonly are DSMB or Data Safety Monitoring Board reports. Annual reports to the FDA. You will also have if there are serious adverse events that are of interest to the FDA, if you have an IND or an IDE that may need to be reported in real time. You'll, again, you'll have IRB annual reports, but you may have real time IRB reports for serious adverse events and particularly for deaths that occur on study. And then of course you'll have your own data quality or interim reports. You may also have an interim analysis. I did not put that here but that's dependent upon the study, study type, and funding agencies. So let's talk a little bit about DSMB reports. DSMB stands for Data Safety and Monitoring Board. They're also called DMCs, Data Monitoring Committees. They can also generically be referred to as safety boards. All randomized controlled clinical trials should have, at the very least, an external safety monitor. They should be an independent monitoring board. If this is an NIH study, they will select the members. If it is a pharmaceutical study, they may ask your input for members, but there should be no conflict of interest between your safety board, your independent safety monitor, and the investigators on this study. Your DSMB reports can be very small or very large depending upon the duration of this trial, the design of the study, the number of participants, and the length of your case report forms. They will contain information on your site status, the number that are open and recruiting, the number that are in process for being approved, and the number that are closed and why. You'll include demographics for the trial. And this isn't just when the study ends. This is all the way through the duration of the study. They will review the demographics for the trial for screen participants, screen failures, all randomized, and those that have terminated early. The demographics will be shown overall and by treatment arm. Remember, they're looking to see if there is any imbalance by demographics. They don't actually need to know the specific treatment arms. DSMB reports will have data quality. So what does your form status look like? The forms that were expected, completed, missing, overall, and by site. Common missing data elements or issues need to be reviewed and any changes made. Uh, this is something that will be designed according to your protocol. That leads us to the outcomes. Every form with summary statistics by treatment and overall. So you won't be doing the primary outcome analysis. You will not be comparing the groups during the DMC reports, but they are going to want to see, say in this instance, the number of relapses and the number of participants. A large part of the safety report, it is in the name, is the safety reporting. You will show all side effects. I encourage you to have a side effects form that lists all of the known side effects, especially if it is a surgical or medical intervention. Make them check boxes and let them get reported. All adverse events, whether they are expected or unexpected, and all serious adverse events, whether they are expected or unexpected. These reports can be 40 pages, or in the case of the CombiRx study, they were upwards of 600 pages by the time we concluded a seven-year follow-up on upwards of 1,000 participants. We collected a lot of data, and all of that has to be prepared and reported for your DSMB. This is another reason why you want your case report forms to be very streamlined, to only collect the information you need, because you will have to report on everything that you've collected during the process of the study. Once the study has concluded, you'll get to final reporting, and that has a number of things. So every protocol to find outcome needs to be analyzed and reported. Every protocol to find analyses needs to be carried out. You'll use your statistical analysis plan for this. Everything will be done overall and by treatment. 
You will need to create an overall analysis summary report that is separate from your abstracts and publications. The overall summary analysis report will go to all of the primary investigators uh, and it will be used to generate additional information or additional publications. And then depending upon the funding source, you will have a clinical study report or a trial study report. That format will be provided to you from the funding source. If it's an NIH study, it's now reported through clinicaltrials.gov, and they have a format that is required for those studies. Publications can be many things, generally abstracts, posters, oral presentations, manuscripts. In addition to that, you can use this information for future grant submissions, which could also be considered a publication. So it is in your best interest to make sure that you have cleanly provided tables with treatment arm and overall status for every outcome, every data element that you have collected so that you have a source document to go back to when you are trying to create all abstracts, posters, oral presentations, and manuscripts. This is where you will rely very heavily on your statistical group or your statistician. They will be responsible for the bulk of all of what has been talked about today. Make sure to consult with your statistician on your case report forms. They will help you design data elements and data capture instruments that will lead to cleaner and better analysis. In addition, they will write the research methods and results section of every one of these publications for you. And that gets you from start to finish, protocol to publication. This should demonstrate to you that every element in your protocol will become a data element, will become a case report form, will be reported on, and will be analyzed. So make sure you streamline your protocol, only collect what is needed, make sure your protocol is very specific so that this process can then be streamlined and easier for all involved and result in being able to answer and analyze your primary question and primary data and then be able to publish that and disseminate the findings to the scientific community.